Okay, thank you very much for joining in. I think we're gonna have a wonderful evening. Uh, he told me to uh, keep it short, so I'm gonna keep it as short as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, or actually I should say gentlemen and gentlemen, <laughs> Thank you very much and good night. I made it short. <laughs> That's short enough, Alan? <laughs> sure. Perfect. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is this webinar all about? This is public speaking for FJMC leaders. Any FJMC leader or any leader of any organization will do at some point in time a certain amount of public speaking. So it's not just FJMC. And I love this course when I used to teach it for, uh, for business when I was working. I'll talk about that a bit later. I used to love teaching public speaking because it wasn't just a job skill, but rather a life skill, something they could take out of the classroom, either into their job or any place in life. But before I go any further, I want to first of all, Thank those of you who are here, even though you don't know me. And I especially want to thank those who are here in spite of the fact that you know me. So, so let us move on now and discuss and find out who am I? Who is Bob Levine who suddenly appeared out of nowhere? Well, first of all, I work backwards. I was a international president of FJMC from 2001 to 2003. Two primary achievements I feel during my administration Number one was the creation of the FJMC Foundation, which I will very gladly admit I did with the help of a man named uh, Bob, Bob, Sha Bob Schachter in Palm Beach, uh, Palm Beach, Florida. And the other one was the development of the FJMC Safer Haftarah Scroll, which Rabbi Simon and I came up with on a trip to Israel uh, in 2002. Prior to that, I was a vice president of FJMC for a few years, and I had um, over the years the roles of chairman of training, no great surprise, chairman of regions, and chairman of the Yellow Candle program. I was also involved in development of the um, worldwide RAP program. Before that, I was president of the Northern New Jersey region for two years, and before that, president of the men's club of the East Brunswick Jewish Center in the middle of New Jersey. Close to nothing, but not that far away from the Jersey Shore, Atlantic City, New York City, Philadelphia, and the Jersey Mountains. But right there, there wasn't anything. That's my men's club history. On a personal note, I started out my business career working in computers in the 1960s, when computers weren't the size of your thumbnail, but rather a room that you could walk into. And after about six or seven years there, I got a job teaching computer science at a local community college where I spent the next 10 years. And after that, I then went out on my own and was an independent, computer, uh, independent trainer. I developed and delivered courses for corporations. One of the courses that I delivered was from a woman who was an experienced uh, speech teacher from college and this was on presentation skills. And I also taught that for a, no a number of times for the FJMC a number of years ago. So that's who I am. Enough about that. Let's get on to why we're here tonight, which is to help you all gain some additional speaking skills and some confidence and hopefully avoid the horrible thing called stage fright. There are four key elements in any speech. The speaker, the speech, the audience, and the occasion. Let me go through those one by one in some detail. The speaker, that's you, not me. Today I'm the speaker, someday you're gonna be the speaker as well. It's important that you indicate your credentials at the start. I don't like when someone stands up in front of me and says, I wanna introduce Bob Levine, and they have a sheet of paper in their hand, and they start reading off um, almost like a resume, which, is, which may or may not be completely true. And after a while of hearing things said about me that weren't really true, I decided the best thing is, as I told Alan or asked Alan for tonight, please just introduce me by name, I'll introduce myself. But you have to establish uh, your credentials and indicate why they should be listening to you during the presentation. Second issue is appearance. How do you look? The key to appearance 
is that you should fit in with the group. Not be overdressed, not be underdressed. If you have to be one or the other, you're better off being overdressed than underdressed. I'll give you a good example why. I once went to a men's club meeting years ago. It was a breakfast meeting, as we usually had then. And the speaker was a very successful um, salesman of mutual funds and manager of a mutual fund office. And he came in for this for these, uh, breakfast and the speech in a business suit, a dark business suit with a tie. He sat down, we had breakfast, and during breakfast, he looked at everyone in the audience and realized he was the only one dressed up. So when he got up to speak, he was introduced, he got up to speak. As he was making his introduction, he casually removed his jacket and put it on the back of his chair. Then he started walking around the room. As he was walking around the room, he starts unbuttoning his shirt and rolling up his sleeves and rolling up the other sleeve. Then he casually, again, as he's talking, walks back to the front, goes behind his chair, takes off his necktie and puts it on the chair. That's how you dress down. It couldn't have worked in reverse. If he came in in jeans and a t-shirt, he would have been in trouble. So find out beforehand what's the appropriate dress if you don't know, dress up. If you're going to be speaking in a shul, either a Devar Torah or perhaps just to give greetings for the FJMC, the safe way is to go there dressed with a tie and jacket. The delivery we'll talk about a little bit later. So that's the speaker. What about the speech? There are three types of speeches, informative, persuasive, and entertaining. I can tell you from experience over many years, that you will not be asked at all to ever give a speech that's to entertain people. Unless, of course, you're the rare person who is either a professional comic or has amateur comedian experience and people know that you can be funny. Otherwise, forget entertaining. Which leaves us with the two, informative and persuasive. There isn't an awful lot between the two because if you're trying to persuade people to do something, you have to first inform them <clears throat> of what it is. The informative speech is where you're explaining about something that the people don't know about. And you want to say, or cover three main areas. What? What is it that we're talking about? Why? Why is it important for you and or your club to know this? And finally, how? How does it work? With a persuasive speech in the same area, you still go through the same inform informing part, but after you inform, then you would have the key thing, which is called a call to action. Ask them to do something. If you've ever been to sales training, you'll know that after you learn to give everyone the features and the benefits, you finally have to ask for the order. In a, in a speech, the call to action is equivalent to the asking for an order. We've just talked about Wine on the Vine, our brand new program. We've talked about what it is, how it works, and why it's important for you to know. After the meeting, when you have a chance, please, and after you leave the shul, go on the internet to the following website, www.fjmcwine.org, fjmcwine.org. While you're there, look at it, see what the program is like in real life, and also, especially, because here we are only a few days before Rosh Hashanah. Try it out. Think of someone who you'd like to send a Rosh Hashanah greeting to and plant a vine in their honor. See how the program works by doing it. That's a call to action. That's what makes an informative speech into a persuasive one. So we have the speaker and the speech. Then comes the audience. Know who they are. Are they in the same age range as you are? Are they older or are they younger? Now I can see by looking here that we have both older and younger. Thank you, Jerry. At least we have on that, someone on that side who's older, and I think most of you are younger. I'm sure most of you are younger than I am. Also, the gender. Are you speaking to a men's group, a women's group? And I spoke, I've spoken in my time to sisterhoods. And I've spoken at the women, uh, Women's League Convention. Or are you speaking to both men and women? Know who you're speaking to. Also, you want to know their knowledge of your topic. How much do they really know about what you're talking about? Do you have any experts there 
we have to watch out for gotcha type of questions. Speaker, speech, audience, and the last is the occasion. The occasion could be a club board for a board meeting, a club membership meeting, a regional board or membership meeting, or could be a shul. And I want to tell you right now that you have to go with some flexibility. You're going to go be prepared to, say, to make a speech, but you have to be prepared to be flexible. I'll give you my favorite example of flexibility. We had a, an executive committee meeting somewhere in the Philadelphia area at one time, and I was asked or assigned, I'm not sure how it went, I was assigned to give a talk simply to give greetings from the FJMC at a temple called Har Zion in Philadelphia. So I got there, looked around, it was a beautiful temple, large temple, and I sat in the congregation. During the service, I noticed things going on that made it very, very unusual. Now, I don't mean they were davening in Swahili instead of Hebrew, but it was very unusual because so much was happening at that service. There was a bar mitzvah, I believe a bat mitzvah also on the same day. And during the Torah service, they had an ufra and a baby naming. It wasn't the same couple, by the way. It was an ufra and a baby naming. And then finally afterwards, the rabbi, they had a long-term rabbi who had retired, and I believe he was in Israel for a year, and this was his first time back, and they were welcoming him back. So I said to myself, as I'm watching the service, if I talk about the FJMC, most of the people here will have no idea what that is, because they came for the specific simcha that they want to be with. So therefore, it doesn't make any sense to talk a lot about FJMC. I was introduced, went up to the Biba, and I said to the effect, wow, what a great shul this is. You folks have so much going on. I've never been to a shul before where they have so many simchas in one day. Mazel tov, it's fantastic, you're great. And by the way, I want to mention to anybody here who's from the, uh, from the men's club, I'd like to speak to any men's club leaders afterward. Now you know who I am, because I'm up here in front of you. I don't know who you are, because you're out there in the uh, congregation. Please look for me during the Kiddush, and let's talk a bit about your men's club and see what the FJMC and or your region can do to help you and make the men's club better. And that was the whole thing. Not what I intended to say, but what I felt the occasion warranted. Okay. How do you prepare to speak? First of all, you prepare a brief outline. Don't write it out. You never write out a speech. Just outline the main points you want to cover. Write them in the on the top two thirds of a sheet of paper, a large sheet of paper. Don't use note cards. Index cards are not good for speaking notes because if something happens and you drop them, then you are in front of your audience playing 52 pickup. Use one or two sheets to outline the whole speech. Also, if possible, simulate the speech environment. So for example, if you're, if you're gonna speak in a, in a shul, there's no real way to, sim to simulate that without going to your shul. However, for practice purposes, if you're going to a board meeting, then if you have a dining room table in your house, go into the dining room, ask your spouse, ask kids if you have kids, around the, to be around the table and talk to them to get the practice of working in a small environment with one table and have people all around it. If it's a, a men's club meeting in a larger room like in a classroom, then go to your living room and have the people spread out there so you cover the whole group. Also remember, you know what you're going to say, they don't. That's very important. If you forget something, never say, I forgot. If you forget it and you realize you forgot it and it's important enough, if it's not important, just forget it. But if it's important, then what you do is you work it in sometime later at a relatively appropriate point. By the way, people have been asking me about X, Y, and Z and get in what you forgot to say earlier about X, Y, and Z. Also a rule which I always followed, arrive early and get acquainted with the environment and the equipment if you're going to be using equipment. You have to get there early, especially if it's going to be like in, in a, in a uh, shul. If it's a shul I've never been to before, I like to get there early before the service starts. And maybe one or two people are around. I'll ask someone to stay in the back of the room. I'll go up onto the bima, 
get comfortable with looking at the entire room from the beam of point of view. And then I'll speak into the microphone, if there's a, assuming there's a microphone there, and I'll ask the people in the back, can you hear me? If not, can you hear me now? Or if it's too loud, I lower it down a little bit. So I have a feel for how close I have to be to the mic and how loud I have to speak. If there's food beforehand, and come on guys, let's face it, we're Jewish, right? Everything we do, with the exception of Yom Kippur, involves food. So chances are you're either speaking at a breakfast, you're speaking at a dinner, maybe you're speaking after a cocktail hour, maybe you're an after dinner speaker, there's always food involved. And if you have food before your speech, eat lightly. Don't stuff yourself, eat lightly. And the reason, of course, that if you stuff yourself with too much food, too much food tends to want to leave your body before too long. And you don't want to have that happen while you're giving your speech. Also avoid certain things like milk products, caffeine, alcohol. Why? Because they all tend to produce dry mouth or contribute to dry mouth. You should also have a drink of something handy, like now, in case you do get a little bit of dry mouth. Also avoid carbonated drinks. What's carbonation? It's air. Air goes in your body, and like the food, air decides to come out whenever it's ready. And you want to make sure that doesn't occur during your speech. So eat lightly and watch what you drink. When you're up in front of a group, you give certain communication signals to the audience. The three signals involved in spoken communications are visual, vocal, and verbal. Now, the visual, visual what the audience sees. Up until 1960, all people involved in public speaking felt that the most important aspect of speaking was the verbal, the words that you're using, what you're telling the people. An event occurs in, occurred in 1960, which changed all of that. The event was the very first televised presidential debate between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Now, back in 1960, everybody didn't have three or four or five TVs in the house. My son-in-law has three TVs in his man cave. That's how he watches football on Sundays. But in those days, in 1960, a lot of people had zero TVs at home. We had a TV in our house. I was living with my parents then. I remember very vividly, my father and I listened to, listened to the debate on the radio. My mother may have been watching Molly Goldberg in the other room. I don't really know what was going on, but I know the two of us listened to it on the radio. After it was over, we discussed it. And we both felt the same way that Nixon did the better job than Kennedy, that he won the debate. And Nixon was a champion debater going back to his college days. Well, after the debate was over, the pollsters took over. And they took over and they started calling people. Did you watch it on TV? Did you hear it on the radio? Who do you think won? And when they finally com computed all the results, they found that people who listened on the radio as my father and I did, felt that Nixon won by maybe 55 to 45%. However, those who saw it on TV felt that Kennedy won like 65 to 35%, overwhelming. From that day on, everyone realized that the key aspect of spoken communications is the visual, what the people see. Nixon was sort of sitting there, I saw later on, he was sort of sitting there talking, sort of like I am, but Kennedy was, Ask not what you can do for your country, ask what your country can do for you. I know that was a different speech, but he was very physical and uh, active in using his hands. In terms of what the audience sees, we mentioned before, dress appropriate, appropriately for the audience. What to do with your hands? Just be natural. Don't stand there with your hands drooped to your side. Don't stand there like this with your arms folded. Don't stand there like that. Just use your hands as you would when you speak, as you would speak conversationally. Actually, a speech is just an enhanced conversation. Facial expressions. If you're saying something humorous, smile. If you're saying something serious, don't smile because it's not appropriate at that time. 
also maintain eye communication with everybody. Now that's not what it sounds like. You don't go and stare at one person, then another person, then another person, then another person. What you do is you scan the audience from side to side, from back to the middle to the front, and just keep scanning around, moving your head as well as your eyes. And eventually at some point, you'll catch virtually everybody in the audience. This way, everybody feels that they are part of the speech and you're talking to them as well as to everybody else. So that's the visual, the key element. The vocal, what the audience hears. This is a case of how do you use your voice? Is your voice monotone where everything you say is always at the same level, you don't have any emotion in it? Or do you vary your voice, or vary the pitch, raise the voice a bit, lower the voice a bit, as necessary, as important to make a key point. You also want to vary the volume to speak. Sometimes you may want to speak louder if you want to say something that people really have to hear, or if it's something minor, you might speak a little softer. We also have the punch. The punch is not like that. The punch is punch out something important so they understand that it's important. The emphasis you make will make it important. There's also a pause. I'll give you a simple example of that. I'm here to tell you a about a great new FJMC program. It's called Wine on the Vine. Notice the pause, it's called, pause. When you say that, it's called and you pause, then people are paying attention and listening to you. Wine on the Vine. The problem with Wine on the Vine, if you will, is a problem is that wine and vine rhyme. And if you say wine on the vine, they may not understand what you're saying. That's why I emphasize wine on the vine so they know the name of it properly. Okay, the other one is called verbal. The verbal are the words that you use, the actual speech that you make. You speak in very simple but descriptive language. Don't write it out. Be flowery, use very short sentences, basically long phrases. Avoid buzzwords and jargon. Now, a lot of people don't realize when they use buzzwords and jargon. I'll give you a very simple example of my stupidity, okay? Well, I went to my first men's club breakfast. After the, after the breakfast, it comes to the end of the meeting and some of the people start saying, let's bench, time to bench. I hadn't been in a shul in years. So I'm looking around to see where the benches are. And I couldn't find them. That to me is jargon or buzzword. Everybody doesn't necessarily know that. In our case now, if we're at a uh, potential member of the FJMC, and we wanna convince them to join the FJMC, we're talking about the benefits that we provide. We have this great thing called LDI. They'll have no idea what you're talking about. We have this great thing, it's called the Leadership Development Institute, better known as LDI then you can use LDI because you've explained what it is. So be very careful about buzzwords and about jargon. Once you have your speech prepared, and again, prepared on a large sheet, use the upper two thirds of the page, not the entire page, because if you have a sheet in front of you and you have to look down at the bottom, you go like this and your, your head is down facing the audience and you don't want to do that. Practice out loud several times. And remember the famous words of the poet Robert Burns, if we only had the power to see ourselves as others see us. Well, when he wrote that back in 1786, they couldn't see themselves. But nowadays, we have the power to see ourselves. It's called a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop. We can record ourselves and see ourselves as we speak. And let me explain the three ways to do that, the correct ways to do that. Record yourself with any device speaking. Then play it back and watch it once or twice. Make note of any areas that you need improvement. Then you wanna focus on the three aspects we just talked about, the visual, vocal, and verbal. The first will be the visual, the most important. And the way you focus on the visual is very, very simple. As you're about to start the playback, turn the volume on the device to zero. Then start the playback and you'll see yourself moving 
your hands, your head, your eyes, and so on, but you won't be distracted by the actual words that you're saying. That's how to check the visual. And do that once or twice. Again, making notes of people, uh, make, making notes of areas where you think you have to improve. Check the vocal part of the de delivery, how you use your voice. You do this in exactly the reverse way. You record yourself, but before you start the playback, you make sure the volume is on, but you cover up the screen. If it's a uh, smartphone or a laptop or, or a uh, tablet, that's easy with a sheet of paper. If it's a desktop, as I have here, what you can do is either close your eyes, turn around, or simply you know, just sit here and focus on the vocal. The verbal content, you would do exactly the same way as you did the vocal because it's sound. So again, you would play it back, but now closing your eyes or looking away, you're gonna focus on the specific words that are being said and the diction with which you're speaking. So those are the ways to really effectively practice. When you're doing a speech, you did an introduction, you gave them a speech, then you wrap up by doing a quick wrap up of the important points. What we've covered here in the past half hour are the key elements of a speech. Speaker, the speech, the audience, and the occasion. They're valid for all speaking situations. We just discussed the three aspects of communication between the speaker and the audience, the visual, the vocal, and the verbal. And we mentioned that the visual is the most important one. We've talked about preparing for the speech, simulate the speech environment, make sure you arrive early. And of course, last but not least, practice, practice, practice. Practice doesn't necessarily make, per make perfect. However, perfect practice of perfect techniques will make perfect. That close with a, mem a memorable statement. At this point, Alan, I'd like to ask for questions. How do you want to handle this? We'll do a question and answer session now. Bob? Yes. Was it the East Brunswick Jewish Center or New Brunswick? East Brunswick. I grew up in Matawan. Okay. And uh, my mom's parents were founding members of Temple Shalom in Aberdeen. Okay. Is that the one on Lloyd Road? Um, <clears throat> no. You're thinking of... You're thinking of Temple Beth Am. Okay. Okay. Um, Temple Shalom is off of Church Street on Airmont Lane. Okay. Eric, do you have a question for? Yeah, do you have a question for Bob, Eric? Um. No. Okay. <laughs> um. All right, who's, who has questions for Bob about public speaking, not geography? Let's see, uh, uh, okay. Bruce Fager. Uh Hi, Bob. Um, how do you feel about uh, using visual aids, uh, a PowerPoint? Uh, I know a lot of speakers uh, read their PowerPoints. <laughs> do you have any, any advice? I made my living for many years with PowerPoints. But uh, actually, in those days, we didn't have PowerPoints, we had overhead transparency. Mm -hmm. and, that, and those were my notes. I could look up at the, at the screen, see the, the points on the notes, and that was, that was all I needed. That was enough to, to remind me what I had to say. So I, I think it's fine to do it. But, but you don't wanna be there just reading them. And you wanna make sure that the, no, that the information you have on the PowerPoint, simply a few words here and there, like I said, simple descriptive language, just key words, key points that you can then talk about. Because if you have full sentences, you'll fall into the trap of reciting the sentences. And you have to assume that people can read on their own. And they don't need you to read to them. Unless you're reading bedtime stories. <laughs> right, the, the, the other, 
you know, the other piece of that is that if you've got a PowerPoint with too much text on it, you're going to lose your audience because they're going to be reading it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Bob, what do you think of, uh, of Toastmasters? I think it's a very good group. I never belonged to them. It's a very good group, though. And I know a lot of good speakers who uh, got their training, if you will, at Toastmasters. There was no Toastmasters that I knew of at the time in terms of where I lived. That's something I would have liked to have done. Bob, do you believe in the uh, saying, uh, tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you just said? Yeah, that's very simple. Start with an introduction. Talk, uh, talk about whatever it is you're talking about. And finally, wrap it up with this, a very quick conclusion, a very quick ending. That's what uh, the sainted Bert Fishman used to tell us. Yeah. I got to tell you, okay, I got to tell you a story about Bert Fishman. My favorite Bert Fishman. <laughs> when I first started out with FJMC, uh, well, after I was uh, regional pro president, I wasn't involved in international then. But I was asked by Steve Davidoff, who was then chairman of training, to develop a president's, club president's training class to be given out at some place on Long Island. I forget where it was. I prepared it, went out there, delivered it. It was a huge success. Everybody loved it. Steve gave great reviews back to the organization. And I was asked to prepare a train the trainer to train about 20 FJMC people to teach this class. And we did it. And I remember the day very vividly. It was Halloween night, October 31st, 1992. It was at a hotel near Newark Airport because people had to fly in from out of town. I went through piece by piece, slide by slide, things to say on the slide. One of the people attending was Bert Fishman. Bert never let me forget. He told me the next day and every time over the next X number of years that I knew, uh, knew Bert, he always said, Bob, I still can't get over the fact that you kept us at that class after 11 o'clock. Not only did I keep them after 11 o'clock, I gave them a homework assignment to be prepared for the next day. <laughs> yeah, he never forgot that. <laughs> Great guy, and I miss him as well. I'm sure you all did. Well, all did. in fact, in fact um, after that, as a result of that, I became vice president uh, the next year, and I was chamber of training. And the first thing I did, since I'm a believer in delegation, I asked Bert, if he would be in charge of club president's training. And I have asked Mike Braslaw from MAR if he would be in charge of regional president's training. And the three of us put together a training program that was very successful and eventually grew into what Norm and Bert created, the LDI. So, yeah. mm. That was a great guy, we all miss him. Norm? Yeah, so I have a little bit of a Bert story too, but I'll get to it in a second. Uh, first of all, I want everybody to know, Bob has been, you know, uh, really incredibly influential in me in all the speeches that I've given in the last 35 years, because one of my first FJMC trainings was with Bob Levine out here in Chicago. Uh, and I think you were teamed up with Bert at the time, if I remember correctly. I think, yeah, I think, I think Steve may have come. So, so, so you said something during this presentation, and I had my uh, tug of war with Bert for 20 years over this one line that you gave during this presentation, which by the way, I thought was terrific. Um, and that is to uh, never write out your speech, but always use an outline. Correct. And being an attorney, I don't like rules that apply all the time because no rule can apply all the time. So I just wanted to share with you that with my experience, because I've given many, many presentations, my profession called for me to do that. And when I'm doing persuasive or when I'm doing educational, I absolutely agree with you. Don't write it out because you can't persuade anybody if they think you're reading something. Right. But I found that there are times, for instance, when I'm giving, asked to give a drosh or I'm asked to give a quote five minute presentation or three minute presentation and I have a lot that I want to say that it served me well to write it out but then practice it so many times that I have it in front of me but nobody knows I'm reading it but I have written it out 
and I and and I use it almost like a teleprompter, even though I don't and I never have the tech the goal, uh, you know, um, backup with a teleprompter. But I, but I have found that on occasion, it's worked for me well to write something out when it's a time-bound uh, presentation that I want to say a lot. And what do you feel about that? Okay, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I was installed as president in Toronto. And at the dinner, uh, which, which was on uh, Saturday, Saturday evening, we had like multiple levels of tables. I was at one level with Steve Davidoff and uh, Gim Kimball, and you and Bob Raitman and others were at the level right up above us. And Bob was right over my right shoulder. And after the speech was over, Bob said to me, I don't understand how you did it. I saw your sheet of notes. And you could have had 15 words on the whole thing. And yet you gave like a 15 minute talk. The answer is very simple. I didn't do like you said, I didn't write it out, but I thought it out and talked it out time and time and time again. That all I needed to do it on that night was a few notes. Make sure to cover this point, cover that point, cover the other point, and that's it. That's just the way I do it. Okay. My, my concern with writing things out, that God forbid you lose it, and you lose it, and you, and you, have, your, you have no speech. You have to be prepared to talk uh, extemporaneously off the top. Well, I, I think we're talking the same thing because by the time I present it, I do have words in the margin. And that's pretty much all I'm looking at. Okay. okay. But but I but I have written out speeches, and haven't relied only on outlining. Is my point. Okay. By the time I deliver it, it's basically an outline. But but there are times when I find myself actually writing out that presentation before I give it. What what are you? What you're really saying, Norm, as you said, is we're both doing the same thing, but one of us is walking this way and one of us is walking that way. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. I, I did my time, my speeches also were written out and, and read over many times because of the occasion could happen where the speech isn't quite there. In fact, we did have that occasion. And uh, I, I don't remember if I was installing Norm or doing something and my speech ended up in the room, in the hotel room, and that was fortunately yeah. I had gone over that enough times that I, I knew the highlight of it and I was able to probably right. do better than I had with the written speech. Right. Uh, so it, just preparing and reading over. Uh, in those days too, I, I did a lot of handwriting. I wasn't a good typist. We didn't have much other things. Uh, I still have some of them and I used the same speeches all over, but it was just looking at the highlights of the points there and I didn't necessarily read what was on the paper. <laughs> As I, as I always, as I tell Jerry, Jerry doesn't remember, but he installed me as regional president. We came to the dinner because uh, we had someplace to go the next day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought Chuck Simon was going to install me. But Chuck came up, got up, gave a speech and sat down. And I turned to Jerry and said, who's going to install me? And Jerry said, I guess I will. So that was a very <laughs> off the cuff speech, Jerry. And look what you got from it. <laughs> I was strictly just training. I had no speech training when I went into this business of, of men's club. Uh, and it was just a matter of learning as I went along uh, what right. to do. OK. Other questions? Mark. So relatively early on in my FJMC career, when I just came out of the club and started with Region, um, I started to be dispatched to talk to shuls and prospective synagogues or, or clubs that are not mine. Um, and Norm gave me uh, some great advice that um, to always include a, a touch of Torah in my speech someplace. And I would find that very hard to do if I was running an outline, um, though. That that would be, I think, a challenge for me, my, only because maybe I'm not uh, you know, as learned as, as other folks. But, but, I, but I think that idea really went well because uh, I was in other, other synagogues besides myself. I didn't come across as a scholar. I just tried to tie in my theme into something in that particular Torah a portion for that week because there's, um, there's leadership everywhere you know, in, in the Torah. So it, it's not difficult to, to find some sort of nugget to talk about. So thanks to Norm for that. And, and Bob, what do you think about that idea? Okay. I, I learned years ago that if I'm ever going to do a Devar Torah, if I'm asked to do a Devar Torah, 
the first thing you do, of course, is read the Torah portion. And in that, <laughs> I'll find something in that Torah portion that relates to the occasion. And I, I really hit the jackpot once. Uh, I was down in, again, in Philadelphia. And this was um, a synagogue of Rabbi Stanley Rosenblum. And the occasion was, I was invited to give a Devar Torah. So I read the Torah portion, and the Torah portion happened to be the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. So I thought, ah, oh, this is great. I was reading it, and I read the whole thing, and I suddenly realized when I got through, the only time in the entire portion that Abraham and Isaac spoke is after they leave the servants, and they're going up to the mountain, and Isaac says, Father, Abraham hit a knee, and Isaac says, we have the wood, we have the flint, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. And that was the conversation. And I read the rest of that chapter. Then I got a little bit curious. So I backed up in the Torah, in the Chavish, back to the birth of Isaac. And there's no time between the birth of Isaac and that day when the two of them are recorded as speaking. So then I had to go the other way and continue until the death of Abraham. And it turns out that within the lifespan of Isaac, when Isaac and a Abraham were together, the only time they ever spoke was that one day on the way up to the mountain. That one little, we have the wood, we have a flint, where's the lamb? That was it. And it so happened that we were at Stanley Rosenblum's shul, and he was the rabbi who started us on our wonderful Hearing Men's Voices program. And they had just come out, we had just come out with the book, I think, Our Fathers Ourselves. So I had my whole, my whole Devar Torah written for mm -hmm. me. As soon as I read that, I knew what I had to talk about. I also had the opportunity while I'm there to do something which is always, always nice to do. I thanked the uh, Rabbi Rosenblum for what he had done for us in starting Hearing Men's Voices, which I still think is the best program we've ever done. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well. I thank very much. I thank everyone for participating. I thank Bob for a tremendous presentation. It was really wonderful. I think it was very, very educational, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, it was entertaining too. It was it educational, persuasive, entertaining? You, you hit all three notes. He's formative. He, he, he probably wrote it all out. No. <laughs> Bob provide the outline. Let's see. Let's see the outline. <laughs> so that we, you know, that you can. On that side of my eyelids, okay. <laughs> well, it was really great, Bob. We're, we're, we're thrilled to have you back in the fold and yes. looking forward to seeing you more and more and participating and learning from you uh, as time goes on. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you all to those of you who I may not speak to beforehand. I wish you all a very happy new year, good health in the coming year to you and your family, and safety. Thank you, Alan, for doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's your call. Thank you, Bob. I wish Thank that you. Have a Beautiful presentation. Good night to everybody.